Hi and welcome to this new installment of the Pass Forward series. Um, I'd like to thank the board for the invitation and also the previous presenters whose presentations I've enjoyed immensely. My name is Tyson Retz. I'm Associate Professor at the University of Stavanger in Norway. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about the question of scale in history and history education. But I'm also here to provoke and my provocation tonight uh, is to suggest that the history discipline remains the best guide for thinking about the nature, purposes, and methods of historical teaching and learning. I'll need to talk about the history discipline and I'll need to say something about uh, this remains factor that suggests that it has been in the past uh, considered the best model for teaching and learning. I think it's useful to think of history education as two intellectual traditions. Uh, the continental uh, German-based tradition, uh, very much uh, with its roots in German idealism, humanism, Bildung, and what's translated in English as the human sciences, um, kind of naturally uh, creates these conditions for history, to, history education to be considered um, as part of the history discipline because it is conducted from uh, that tradition of, of the history discipline. Story is a little different uh, in Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, that tradition where uh, curriculum studies tends to be the paradigm within which uh, education is discussed and theorized. Um, very much has its origins in the growth of educational psychology in the 20th century, um, and very much interested in uh, the measurement of um, things like uh, cognitive development to, to observe uh, children's uh, cognitive development, which told a, a very negative story for history for most of the 20th century uh, with the Piagetian-led uh, research, which uh, made out history to be quite a difficult uh, subject, perhaps beyond uh, the capabilities of most school-aged children. That situation changed in the 1960s when we had the rise of educational psychologies and philosophies that stressed the structure of the disciplines being a model for uh, their teaching and learning. I tend to talk about this, uh, this as a process of disciplinary distillation. This idea that if you can identify the basic structure of disciplines, say if you identify uh, its core uh, epistemology, then you have a model for its teaching. So you can talk about the epistemological structure of a discipline uh, being a pedagogy. Now, uh, this uh, could be considered a problem because once we start to talk about core epistemology, structure, things like this, perhaps we're assuming a stability or um, uh, a kind of simplicity of identity that a lot of historians would probably not identify in their own practice. So when we ask historians what they think, think history is, they tend to say uh, things like this, history is about incorporating, incorporating numerous different theories and methods. There's no single methodology. You basically do uh, whatever is necessary. It's a horses for courses uh, mentality. So we do run into problems uh, once we start to look at uh, the practice of history and this idea of uh, historical thinking concepts that reflect the basic structure of the discipline. We also have to accept that there are many ways of engaging with the past beyond uh, the purview of traditional uh, historiography and beyond the kinds of questions uh, that professional historians engage with. I think it's necessary to say something about the history discipline. We do uh, have work on this. We do uh, have the language to be able to discuss uh, what the history discipline is uh, compared with uh, neighboring disciplines. We tend to talk about the history discipline as an unrestrictive discipline. That is to say, it's a soft discipline, that it is free, that historians are free to, uh, to raid the, the, uh, the toolkits and the theories of uh, their colleagues in the humanities and social sciences. So it's an exceptionally porous discipline um, with very open theoretical and conceptual borders. However, once you start to talk about uh, historians' methodological identity, they tend to agree uh, that uh, historians uh, 
do something unique in the way that they build their arguments on a foundation of empirical evidence. So it gets back to that idea of, of laboring in the archive and doing something with empirical evidence that uh, um, their colleagues in the other disciplines may not do so vigorously. They also tend to agree that uh, whatever type of history they practice, uh, history situates human experience in time and space. So if we take this quote from Ernest Brezak, uh, time introduces a tension into human existence between inescapable change and the human need for continuity. I'm bringing this up because I'm here to talk about uh, the concept of scale uh, and matters of scale and how they uh, connect with the current state of the history discipline and my argument, of course, that the current state of the history discipline uh, is someplace uh, that we should continue to look to think about the nature of and purposes and methods also of, of school history teaching. So to state that very clearly, uh, what I'm saying is that rather than seeing disciplinary history as inert and somehow cut off from public concerns, a renewed engagement with both the state and theory of the discipline will reveal the questions, problems, and tensions that are currently fueling change and innovation in response to the crises of our times. These must surely have a central role to play in the 21st, uh, in a 21st century history education. Uh, so this question of scale uh, is something that I think uh, we ought to be engaging with uh, as history educators. It's certainly for the past two decades become probably the most fundamental uh, change uh, in the way that historians uh, talk about their practice. Uh, if we take this from uh, a special a special issue of uh, the American Historical Review from 2013, the question of why matters of scale in historical analysis have become an object of concern and self-reflection in recent years is a fascinating one that provides us with an invitation to reflect on some of the fundamental changes that history has been going through in recent decades. So I'm suggesting that this it is a discussion that has been underway um, for a decade or two in the history discipline. And I think that uh, we as history educators have a little bit of catching up to do uh, to, to consider its implications. Now the journal uh, History and Theory uh, in two, uh, 2014 also uh, looked at this. On the one hand, globalization has brought with it more complex and heterogeneous temporal relations in which the global time of commerce, technology, and media comes into conflict with the different rhythms in the variety of cultures and communities. On the other hand, the deep times of climate change, giving rise to the new periodization of the Anthropocene, challenges the limited temporal horizons of social relations and political decisions, and forces us to renegotiate our views of past, uh, past uh, and future. So I'm suggesting here that within the history discipline itself, we don't have to look too far. If we look to uh, the theory, and the state of the history discipline itself, we really have a rich, uh, a rich source of, 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 of thinking on, on, on where we are. And I think these also reflect uh, present day values. Um, we are interested in questions of scale so much uh, because of our current state, because of our current crisis, um, where we have such things as deep history because we are looking to a history that goes back further than, uh, than, than, than this period that has uh, been the source of, of so much of uh, destruction and of uh, our present day problems. So these movements in the scale of history, the way that we're looking uh, back at the past do reflect present day needs and concerns. And I think that most history educators, most educators in general are very interested in present day needs and concerns. And so if we look um, at the discipline and what it's doing, we can think about, we can start to think about what, what it is uh, that might be pressing, and what it might be to do history in new ways uh, for these times. I've talked about the Anthropocene and I just want to lay out before I uh, conclude here that there's perhaps five things that I can just come up with. Uh, there are only examples, there are <laughs> many, many more, of course. Uh, the Anthropocene, uh, if you don't know what it is, well, maybe that's your next uh, video to watch. <laughs> um, it is, uh, it forces us to consider 
uh, such things as the relation of humans to non-humans. Um, it forces us also to consider the collision of human time and geolo uh, geological time. This is uh, from the work of Dipasha Chakravarti, of course, who's written a number of uh, very insightful essays over the course of the past decade, who's really brought out uh, that tension and uh, thought about the implications that it has for uh, a mode of historical inquiry that is so much, that is so based on this idea um, that history is the history of what humankind has done with its own hands. Also, and this is something that interests me a lot, uh, history as a form of activism and political engagement. Uh, if we are living, uh, if we are facing uh, an environmental crisis, we perhaps need uh, ways of engaging with the past that generate uh, uh, some sort of urgency or some sort of need uh, to act, some sort of sense that that action needs to occur. Perhaps we can look to the past and find examples of the possibilities that human beings have had for such action. Also, human as homo uh, is an intentional uh, and self-determining agent, your traditional human of historiography, that uh, human being who acts in the world according to their intentions and so much of our uh, theory of history and even way of teaching history is very much based on that idea that we need to reconstruct what human beings were trying to do, you know, why they acted, uh, getting into empathy territory here, uh, which is uh, the topic of a lot of my previous research. Also, uh, the human as anthropos, this is the human of the Anthropocene, who is an unintentional force, an unintentional power, moreover, who has become a force on a planetary scale. Uh, so this is, is basically history as a story of mostly unintended consequences. That was, of course, Tolstoy's idea of history, that it uh, mainly being about what humans didn't intend. So this whole uh, focus on the reconstruction of, of intentions being uh, missing, missing the most uh, important point. And lastly, uh, history's relation to other disciplines, tensions, uh, limitations, and possibilities. Um, even in arguing that I think the history discipline might be a place to look for inspiration uh, about the kinds of things we can do as history educators. The history discipline is always in conversation with other disciplines. Uh, so there's nothing uh, strictly one discipline, <laughs> to put it that way, uh, singular about suggesting uh, to look to the history discipline because the history discipline has never existed independently of the theories and methods from other disciplines that, 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 that really fuel it. Uh, that's, uh, that's my presentation for today. I wish also uh, just again to, to thank the, the organizers of, of this concept. I think it's been uh, useful for me to, to think about some of, this, uh, some of these ideas and how they might be useful for generating conversation in uh, history education. Thank you.